first scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. The prayer for the Ephesians. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled in the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The second reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 30 and 31, the parable of the mustard seed. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. The word of God for the people of God. Everybody say thrive. Oh, no. Everybody say thrive. thrive. One more time, everybody say thrive. thrive. We're going to talk about money today. We've got to have some enthusiasm for that, right? So I'm going to spend most of our time this morning actually telling you a story um, from my life. Last spring, a few parents at our school learned that we were not planning to offer um, our summer care program for 2014 at, at our school where the boys go. And in past years, we've been able to provide affordable full-time care throughout the summer weeks to school families and to a few families outside the school. And this program had become especially helpful um, to children who needed a place to go in the summer because they either had single parent homes or homes where both parents worked full-time. But in the summers of 2012 and in 2013, our school lost money on the program. And because we're a small private school on a tight budget, the board felt like it just couldn't continue to offer this program. I work at the school with a small group of parents. And we organize some special events, coordinate parent volunteers, and assist in fundraising efforts. And this decision to not have summer school was very troubling for a couple of us. And we took it pretty hard because we felt like maybe we were beginning to let go of important ministry in order to make ends meet. And we were uncomfortable sort of with starting down that path. And we wondered if maybe there was something that we could do to help. The biggest problem with the summer program seemed to be a lack of organization. The summer program needed a leader. The school had been trying to cut costs by running the logistics through the front office without kind of a key person there. And the front office wasn't staffed full time in the summer. And truthfully, it wasn't really invested in the success of the program. And so a lot of details sort of slipped through the cracks. This, of course, weakened the program and created problems. And we felt like a strong person in a coordination or leadership role for the program could quite possibly turn things around. I helped provide leadership to this little parent group with another woman who, because we've worked together a lot on projects over the past few years, she's become a close friend of mine. And over a week or so, we spent a lot of time talking through the possibilities of how we might help save this program. We realized we were confronting two pretty serious obstacles. The first was money. 
as a parent group, we raise a lot of money, but we also allocate and spend a lot of money. And by last spring, when we were talking about the problems with the program and having these discussions, the majority of the money that we had raised for the year had either been spent or set aside for a project. Looking closely at the numbers in our account, we decided that we really only had about $500 that wasn't already spoken for. And I want you to remember and hang on to that number now, okay, $500. The second pretty big obstacle was, unfortunately, the board itself. And this gets a little tricky, but we have consistently met some resistance when offering ideas or help to the men and women who lead our school. Those relationships are improving as time passes. But if you've ever sat in a meeting and heard people say, well, but we've really never done it that way before, then you kind of get the idea, maybe. But my friend and I were pretty determined, and so we talked with the woman that we knew was the right person to lead the program, and we told her, we have, we have $500, and we'll pay you this as a stipend if you will coordinate the program. We told her we knew it wasn't a lot of money, but amazingly, she agreed. And amazingly, the board agreed to this idea with one condition. The program cannot cost us a penny. Nothing. It was not explicitly stated, but still understood that whatever losses might occur, my friend and I would be responsible, which was a little scary. But we were very sure that God was leading us this way, and so we agreed to the terms. $500 is a mustard seed. It's a tiny thing, really, but it was all that we had, and it was a lot to us. We had hoped to fix a broken water fountain in the main hallway at the school with that money, and we had hoped to buy some additional PE equipment for our kids with that money. But God tapped on our hearts pretty seriously, and both of us felt it, and so we wrote a check and let it go. And we had two goals for the, for, the, for the summer program. And you can guess the first one, I'm sure. The first one was financial, right. We got to break even. That's a pretty big goal. And the second one, but was just as important, was a spiritual goal, that we really wanted the program to be a blessing to a few families who needed a safe place for their kids to be during the summer. It is like a mustard seed, Scripture says, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. I did a little research on mustard seeds as I was preparing for this morning. So hang with me here. I'm going to tell you about a mustard seed. Each seed is about one millimeter. There are 25-ish millimeters in an inch, 12 inches in a foot, which means you would need about 304 seeds stacked on top of each other to get to be one foot of height of a mustard bush. Okay, are you following me? A fully grown mustard bush reaches a maximum of height of somewhere between 10 and 20 feet. So if we just kind of pick 15 feet as a good height for our bush, that would mean we would need over 4,500 seeds stacked on top of each other to get to the height of the bush. If our returns are measured in physical growth of a plant between seed and full growth, that would be a, over a 4,500% return on what we invested by putting that seed in the ground. Our summer program did not produce a 4,500% return. It's not that good of a story, okay? But it did significantly impress us with a 900% return. We invested our $500 mustard seed, and after a 16-week session, we had cleared over $4,500 that went right back into the school's budget. Can anybody say, whoo, <laughs> a 900% return? We were beyond thrilled. Our objective number one was financially break even, and God had Ephesians 3 to us. Do you remember what Mary Jane just read just a few moments ago from Ephesians 3? She said, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So it was good. And since we're talking about money and stewardship today, the financial return is important. We made money. There were a few bumps in the road. I received a few, oh my goodness, you won't believe what just happened, phone calls. But we did it. We made money, real, spendable money, an impressive 900% return. But our 4,500% return has come and continues to come through our objective number two, our spiritual goal of being a blessing to families who needed a safe place for their kids. $500. 
Over the summer, we served 19 children through part-time and full-time care, and two of those kids were ours. Matt and I decided this summer to really put our money where our mouth was and support the program with our most precious asset, our boys. Alex, our older one, didn't go too often, but Josh, our younger son, went three mornings each week all summer long. Now, our Josh is the kind of kid who struggles sometimes to transition, and he was going to be a student at, um, for, at Trinity for the first time um, this fall. And so I kind of saw summer school as an opportunity to sort of ease him into this, you know, hopefully making the fall transition a little bit smoother. The first couple of weeks for him and us were a bit stressful. Josh has the tendency to push boundaries and even run away from teachers at the most inopportune moments. But he was always excited to go to school, and over the summer he learned to be comfortable in his new environment. He mastered taking his lunch to school. He mastered moving from activity to activity at the teacher's request. He made friends with other children, and he became a part of the school that our family loves so much. When school started in late August, there were no tears except mine. Josh had already made a home there. He already belonged there. And that came from the mustard seed of summer program. $500. There was another mom who had two boys in the program who shared with our coordinator what a blessing it was to have the option of summer care at Trinity because her boys had always been separated during the summer because of their large age gap. Previously, there were a lot of tears and not wanting to go to daycare because they wanted to be together. She said, this is the first summer that I don't go to work crying every day because I know my kids are unhappy. This year, they look forward to coming here, and that was an amazing blessing for that mom. $500. Summer program employed three part-time teachers and two part-time aides this year. These were all ladies who would have needed employment somewhere, and they were able to make some money at our summer school. In addition, we had other teachers who gave of their gifts and talents for week-long camps that added variety to the summer schedule. Part-time teachers receiving a salary and camp coordinators receiving a stipend because of summer program. And several of the teachers brought their own children with them as they worked. No child care fees and no summer separation. $500, and we served children of our school families and some families who use public school. We served different ethnic groups and different socioeconomic situations. One little girl broke her leg early in the summer, and she had a cast from ankle to hip, and the other kids took turns pushing her around in a stroller for a few weeks, but they learned to work together. $500. During the summer program, Alex, our older son, participated in the week of science summer camp. He got to spend extra time with two dedicated science teachers who he greatly respects. He learned some great things, spent time with new friends and old friends, and had a blast. And the teachers challenged the kids with a contest where they had to build something that would keep an egg from breaking when it was dropped off the school roof. How many of you parents have had that kind of project in your house at one time or another? Matt and Alex worked on this project together, and I still have this image in my mind of them pouring over the sponges and duct tape, right? They headed out to our front yard to throw this contraption up as high as they possibly could and let it fall back down and Alex just beamed when he opened that up and the egg was still perfectly intact. On the day of the challenge, one of the dads climbed up on the school roof and dropped the contraptions off one by one. A dad on the school roof. He thought there was nothing better than this. He thought it was tons of fun. $500, and I enjoyed having a few hours each week where I could be kid-free. When I left pastoral ministry last June, one of the things I felt God calling me to was to attempt to write a Bible study. It's hard to make time for something like that when you have two busy kids and a busy household, but in those kid-free hours this summer, I completed that Bible study, a good first draft of it anyway. And some people actually did the work, and we had this little small test group here at the church that met for four weeks, and we talked about the study, and I, they gave me good feedback. And it was a huge blessing for me, personally, that grew from the $500 that was the mustard seed of summer program. See, I could tell you a lot more stories, but I know you get the idea. I know you do. The spiritual returns stretch far, too far to measure. Immeasurable returns. And now I have to ask you, what is the mustard seed that you can plant in the life of this church? Every one of us has resources that we must make decisions about how best to allocate and best to use them. A thousand decisions a day about how much to buy and how much to save and how much to give. Ministry 
costs money. It costs money to pay the staff and keep the lights on. It costs money to send people out for mission work and to buy curriculum for classes and studies. It costs money for music, for technology, for maintenance, for improvements. Last year, at this time, we had dreams of an elevator. Today, we can ride in one. And realizing that dream took a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money. And I don't really know how to measure a spiritual return on something like an elevator, but I do know what it feels like to stand at the bottom of those very stairs and look up and feel like there is a mountain between you and the sanctuary. I know what it feels like to be experiencing physical limitations and to want so badly to sit and worship and fellowship and receive a spiritual shot in the arm when you most need it, but you're in a wheelchair. And you also know that people are going to have to wait while you make that difficult climb. I know what it feels like for well-meaning people to watch you as you struggle to make it up and the embarrassment of having an audience while you figure out how you're going to make that work. Some of you know what I'm talking about all too well because it's personal for you. Might you say that the investment we have made in that elevator has the potential of a 4,500% spiritual return? With all my heart, I feel like everything I have, it belongs to God. And yet, like many of you, sometimes I struggle to let go of my money. Last Christmas, God pressed upon my heart to write a $1,500 check for a friend who's battling cancer. I don't know why $1,500, but I know it had been a long time since God had asked me to let go of enough money that it actually hurt me. It seemed like too much. Not too much to give her, but too much to let go of. You hear me? And right at Christmas, but I did write that check and I put it in a card. And I don't know anything about what she did with that money, but I know what it did in our friendship. She has always been pretty guarded with me, and I think she is with most people. But now sometimes we sit and we talk about her illness, about her journey, about the Lord. I don't think she talks to very many people about what she feels, about what she's going through. She's the kind of woman who just kind of puts on a strong face and keeps on going. But sometimes when we're together, she takes off that mask, and she shares her heart, and she shares her fears, and we have cried together. And I think she trusts me a little bit. I can't measure the spiritual return on that, but 4,500% seems like a good guess to me. It's hard sometimes to let go of our money, to listen to how God is guiding us to follow that lead. We know so little about the future, and we tend to hang on to our money, believing that it will help provide security or safety. I get that. I do it too. I invest for retirement. I save. I'm a careful spender. I'm frugal. Some might even say cheap. I love clearance racks, and I love buying things used. I think a lot about money and how best to use it. And spending our school organization's last $500 and writing $1,500 checks makes me really uncomfortable. I'm just being honest with you. But here is what I know. The God that I love is in the business of immeasurable returns. And it's all his anyway. And so I budget that 10% of what we bring home goes directly into ministry into helping to fund the work that God is doing in the world in which I live. Some of that 10% is pledged here. Some of it is pledged and given to our school. Some of it is given in support of international projects that help people who are probably a lot like me, but who weren't born in pleasant, privileged circumstances and don't live pleasant, privileged lives like I do. And every time I write a check, I pray, Lord, may this benefit people in your name. May others come to know you more and experience you deeper through this gift. May the return on what you're asking me to give be immeasurable. I encourage you to be praying about what your gift to this church will be for 2015. On December 28th, as we worship together on the last Sunday of 2014, we're going to do a celebration Sunday of looking back. And Dad is also going to cast some vision for looking forward. I don't know what he's going to bring to us as projects that he feels God is leading us towards, but if I know my dad at all, I will tell you, they will cost money. Amen? In the years I have been in ministry with my dad, I think he puts more stress on the finance committee than anywhere else. But people step up. And God breaks down obstacles, and being witness to the return on investment is quite a ride. 
Our family will fill out a pledge card this year, and for the first time, I'm gonna encourage our 10-year-old son to fill out his own card as well. We will share what we have with this church, and I'm confident that we will watch in amazement together as God produces an immeasurable return. I shared the Casting Crowns song, Thrive With You, as we began our time together, because I think it makes a bold statement when it says it's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive, to thrive. I love that image, and I love this song, because it points out that a key to experience this thriving in our lives, when it says, God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. What is that desire? To know you and to make you known. Maybe that's two desires. To know you and to make you known. That sounds a little bit like our mission statement, which says that what we most desire is to be people who are serious about making disciples for the transformation of the world. To know you and to make you known. Friends, you were made to thrive. Everybody say thrive. thrive. That's right. We were made to what? Thrive. Murphy's Royal United Methodist Church was made to what? Thrive. Yes. Let us be a people who combine our resources of time, talents, and yes, money in order to be a part of a church through the leading of Jesus Christ that has been made to thrive. Let's pray together. Holy Father, help us to want to thrive. Help us to want to be listening to you so that we might hear you leading us in ways that, yes, are a little bit scary, but that have the promise of this immeasurable return. Help us to hold this image of a mustard seed and how it grows into something so much more enormous than what it started as, Lord, because we gave it over to you. Help us in the places in our relationship with you when we are scared to say yes. And help us, Lord God, to be so thankful for the many, many ways that you have blessed us. Grow us as individuals and grow us as a church, Lord God. And thank you so much for inviting us to be in ministry with you. We love you, Lord, and we pledge that what you've given us, we will share with others. And we say all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Emily Hargraves, and I have been a part of this church for most of my life, starting in about third grade. And when we started attending, there were actually two services like there are now, and we attended the later service. I got to know many grandparent-like figures, which was a blessing to a young child whose grandparents lived quite a distance away. Then I made friends and became a part of the youth activities. I have many joyful memories of things that happened in this building. My junior high and high school years were spent in Sunday school and youth group events, making Christmas cookies, doing 40-hour famine lock-ins, and putting up an ugly painted-up toilet in church members' yards. I'm sure many here can remember these things, too. This church has always supported me in my life and in my faith. Even when I was away for so long during college, I never felt disconnected from this congregation. You are part of my relationship with my then boyfriend, now husband, and welcomed him with open arms. One of the most important lessons related to stewardship that I can remember actually occurred downstairs when I was in the senior high Sunday school class. Rick Rungi was teaching our class, and he was discussing with us how we are to support the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. That lesson really made an impression on me, and it is still how I try to guide my life. I believe that each of these pieces is equally important, but of course our topic in these few weeks is stewardship. I look at financial giving to the church as a critical part of my relationship with the church. I cannot be everywhere and do everything And I certainly don't have the talents that many of you do. But together, our financial support creates the foundation the church needs to allow our prayers, presence, and service to be utilized. It is my hope that you will join me in contemplating this as we work together to make disciples of Jesus Christ.